Good morning. Lovely to be able to welcome you to worship this morning. Uh, it's Remembrance Sun Sunday, um, so we do just um, pause uh, just to, to remember those who, who gave their lives uh, in, the, in the Great Wars. Um, please do remember the poppy appeal. Uh, you can give to the poppy appeal. Um, I'm sure most of you have your, your poppies already anyway, but please do, do give to that appeal. Just a couple of announcements to make before we begin. Um, our, our midweek meets on, on Thursday evening. We meet in, in the, the Scott rooms here. We, we look at the book of Daniel. Uh, we are continuing our studies and we'll be looking at chapter 8 uh, this week, the, the chapter that we're looking at in, uh, in our service today. Also, a couple of advance announcements. Um, YF meets uh, next Sunday evening, that's next Sunday evening, uh, the 21st, 7 p.m. Uh, in, in the hall. Also, just PW, PW meets next Wednesday, not this week, but next week, next Wednesday, 8 p.m. for an evening of craft and fellowship. That's Wednesday the 24th. Uh, and those, I think, are all the announcements. We come to worship God, we come to focus on Him, very much look to Him uh, in this time of, of worship. We read in the book of Isaiah, So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. We stand to worship together as we sing, Glory be to God the Father. So we're reading from Daniel chapter 8. Please do take up your Bible and, and, and look up the chapter on page 863, 863 of the Pew Bibles. Daniel chapter 8. This is 
This is God's word. In the third year that Belshazzar was king, I saw a second vision. In the vision, I suddenly found myself in the walled city of Susa, in the province of Elam. I was standing by the river Ulai, and there beside the river I saw a ram that had two long horns, one of which was longer and newer than the other. I watched the ram butting with his horns to the west, the north and the south. No animal could stop him or escape his power. He did as he pleased and grew arrogant. While I was wondering what this meant, a goat came rushing out of the west, moving so fast that his feet didn't touch the ground. He had one prominent horn between his eyes. He came towards the ram, which I had seen standing beside the river, and rushed at him with, his, with all his force. I watched him attack the ram. He was so angry that he smashed into him and broke the two horns. The ram had no strength to resist. He was thrown to the ground and trampled on, and there was no one who could save him. The goat grew more and more arrogant. But at the height of his power, his horn was broken. In its place, four prominent horns came up, each pointing in a different direction. Out of one of these four horns grew a little horn, whose power extended towards the south at the east and towards the promised land. It grew strong enough to attack the army of heaven, the stars themselves, and it threw some of them to the ground and trampled on them. It even defied the prince of the heavenly army, stopped the daily sacrifices offered to him, and desecrated the temple. People sinned there instead of offering the proper daily sacrifices, and true religion was thrown to the ground. The horn was successful in everything it did. Then I heard one angel ask another, how long will these things that were, that were seen in the vision continue? How long will an awful sin place the daily sacrifices? How long will the army of heaven and the temple be trampled on? I heard the other angel answer, it will continue for 1,150 days, during which evening and morning sacrifices will not be offered. Then the temple will be restored. I was trying to understand what the vision meant when suddenly someone standing in front of me. I heard a voice call out over the river, Ulai. Gabriel explained to him the meaning of what he saw. Gabriel came and stood beside me, and I was so terrified that I fell to the ground. He said to me, mortal man, understand the meaning the vision has to do with the end of the world. While he was talking, I fell to the ground, unconscious. But he took hold of me, raised me to my feet, and said, I'm showing you what the result of God's anger will be. The vision refers to the time of the end. The ram you saw that had two horns represents the kingdoms uh, of Media and Persia. The goat represents the kingdom of Greece, and the prominent horn between his eyes is the first king. The four horns that come up when the first horn was broken represent the four kingdoms into which that nation will be divided, and which will not be as strong as the first kingdom. When the end of those kingdoms is near, and they have become so wicked that they must be punished, there will be a stubborn, vicious, and deceitful king. He will grow strong, but not by his own power. He will cause terrible destruction and be successful in everything he does. He will bring destruction on powerful men and on God's own people. Because he is coming, he will succeed in his deceitful ways. He will be proud of himself and destroy many people without warning. He will even defy the greatest king of all. But he will be destroyed without the use of any human power. This vision about the evening and morning sacrifices, which has been explained to you, will come true. But keep it secret now, because it will be a long time before it does come true. I was depressed and ill for several days. Then I got up and went back to work that the king had assigned to me. But I was puzzled by the vision and could not understand it. We give thanks for this God's word to us. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray.
Heavenly Father, we live in a world of change. Every day is filled with uncertainty. We are surrounded by the twists and turns of life. And though we often feel that we have little or no control over the things that happen to us. But Lord, we come now and we stand in your eternal presence. We come to you, Lord, seeking you. We come seeking to find our way and to find hope. We come seeking the kingdom. We come to you, Lord, because you came, came to us first. You came in Christ to us. Lord, on this day, when we remember the lives sacrificed in conflict, when we pause just to think of the awfulness of war, we come thankful, Lord, thankful that you are sovereign, that you are more powerful than the powers and the rulers of this world. You reign over all. Lord, we come to worship you. We come to bow before you. You are the all-powerful and the all-loving God. We rejoice to be here, Lord, in your house, able to worship you, here in your presence. We remember how Jesus rejoiced to worship in the synagogue. We remember, too, Lord, that he cleared the temple so that all the people could worship you. Father, when we think of you, of who you are, of what you have done for us, we are so thankful. Every time we think of Jesus, we want to say thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that Jesus came for us. Thank you that he taught. Thank you that he performed wonderful miracles. Thank you that he died. Thank you that you raised him up again. Thank you that he promises to be always with us. Thank you, Lord, that through Jesus you have enabled us to really know you, to have access to you, Father, to come to your throne of grace. Once to us, Lord, you were just a name, someone in the Bible. Now, Lord, you are real to us, becoming more real every day. May worshipping with you, God, worshipping you, may that be as important to us as it was to Jesus. Father, we brought our, our gifts, our offering to you this morning. Thank you, Lord, that we can be privileged and blessed to contribute to your work in this way. Father, all these things that we have prayed, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, girls and boys, in Daniel now, in the book of Daniel, the part of the book that we're in now, it's prophecy. It's prophecy. And what prophecy is, it's the predictions, the things that God said that were going to happen, that actually happen. Um, and there's lots of prophecy in, in, in the Bible, lots of prophecy. And I suppose we could say that there was prophecy about good things that would happen, good things that would happen. For example, God told Moses that he would give the people a land, a promised land, a land that was good, uh, a land where they would uh, be able to sell. And as time goes on, we see this prophecy fulfilled as the people of Israel came to, to live uh, in the land, uh, their own land, the land which was overflowing with milk and honey. So we see this prophecy fulfilled, uh, and we see many prophecies uh, in the Bible that are fulfilled. But we also see prophecies in the Bible that are about, if you like, bad things. Bad things that were happen. Uh, there's usually, um, these are usually warnings to people. Usually warnings. When the people were sinning, and doing bad things, God would say to them, um, something really bad's going to happen if you don't turn from your ways. Uh, now in the time of the kings of Israel, uh, we saw this when they were told that they would be invaded if, if they didn't turn from their sin. And of course, we see this in the Babylonian army uh, invading. So this prophecy came to be true as well. God said, you'll be invaded, uh, and Jerusalem will be destroyed if you keep sinning against me. The people didn't listen, and this prophecy came true. So we see prophecies in the Bible about bad things that will happen, 
They're not bad prophecies. They're actually good prophecies because they're warning people. Warning people. Now, if you were driving along as a family in your car and you were heading along a road that was going to go off a cliff, you want somebody to warn you, wouldn't you? Of course you would. Of course you would. So there's prophecies like this in the Bible saying you've got to turn from your sin, turn to God, or bad things are going to happen. Finally, in the Bible, we see prophecies about a Messiah. A Messiah, one who would come, who would save his people. Lots of prophecies about a Messiah. One's about him being born in Bethlehem. Uh, one who would be called God with us. Uh, one who would be rejected by his own people. One who would die and bear the sins uh, of his people. And we find all these prophecies come true in Jesus written hundreds of years before he was born. All these prophecies about him come true. Amazing prophecies written so long before he was born. So what do these prophecies tell us about the Bible? These prophecies, the ones that we can see fulfilled, they tell us that the Bible is true. It's true. We should take it seriously. We should listen carefully when it's been, when it's been read take time to read it ourselves. We learn that the Bible is true because of these prophecies which have come to be fulfilled. Let's take a second to pray. Father, we thank you for all the prophecies that are in your word. Thank you that we see so many that have been fulfilled. And through that, Lord, we know that we can trust you, trust your word, and trust the promises that you make in it. We thank you for this, Lord. Amen. Okay, we're going to sing, we're going to sing, Lord, I lift your name on high. boys and girls. morning and we come to remember to remember those lost who lost their lives fighting in, in, the, in the world wars and when we cast our minds to, to the conflicts that are still going on around the world we think of places like Syria, Yemen South Sudan all these places where conflicts are still ongoing Oh Lord, we especially remember civilians who are caught up in these conflicts. Those who are suffering and fearful because of the fighting going on around them. We think of parents 
anxious for the safety of their children. We think of the elderly who can easily flee or defend themselves in these war zones. We pray for the thousands of people who have been displaced by war over these last years, having to leave their home with only what they can carry, looking for refuge in whatever country will have them. We pray for those who have been separated from family, perhaps not knowing where they are now, or even if they are alive. We remember those who have lost loved ones in these conflicts. May they seek you, Lord. May they know your comfort. We ask that these conflicts going on around the world would begin to draw to an end. That you would put it in the hearts of those who wish to make war to instead seek peace, to give up their ambitions of domination, and to seek agreement and a stable system of government for their nations. We pray, Lord, that the more powerful nations could use their influence to bring peace in these places. Lord, we also want to pray for world leaders following the COP26 conference. And Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the commitments that have been made during these last two weeks. And Lord, we pray that you will help, <coughs> help these leaders as they seek to work to fulfill these commitments. Give them all that they need to do this, we ask. Father, we continue to pray regarding COVID. Lord, we have just been disheartened by rising numbers over this last week. So Lord, we come just resting in you, praying, yes, that things would improve, but Lord, in your timing, in your timing, we pray that things wouldn't get worse. We pray, Lord, for those who are ill with this disease at the moment, those in hospital, those struggling with this at the moment. Lord, we continue to think of the most needy in our community at this time. We think of those who are in hospital, those who are anxious, those who are sick, those who are grieving, those who are lost. May they know, Lord, that you are a God who loves them. May they know that you are a God who is faithful in every way. Father, we thank you that we can, in a moment, come to, to think about your word together, to reflect on it, to ask ourselves what you are saying to us through it this day. Bless us, Lord, as we do this. Help us to listen to you, to ask what you require of us, Lord. We pray you would encourage us also through your word. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we come to think about this passage, we're going to sing again, and we're going to sing a hymn called Beauty for Brokenness.
in his vision, Daniel sees things that will come to be over the following few hundred years. And the amazing thing is the accuracy, the accuracy of, of, of these prophecies. These are probably the most detailed prophecies in the whole of Scripture. And we don't have to struggle really to interpret this vision. Um, it's, an interpretation is provided for us. Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, comes, verse 15, and stands beside Daniel and explains the vision to him. The ram in the vision represented the, the Middle Persian Empire. That's the empire that followed the, the, the Babylonian Empire. And the goat represented the Greek Empire, which conquered an area moving east as far as India and south as far as North Africa. And these conquests only took a few years. Now, after the death of Alexander the Great, at the young age of 33, the kingdom, the Greek kingdom, was divided into four, between four of his generals. Now, the text refers to a king who was, in verse 23, stubborn, vicious, and deceitful. Now, scholars mostly agree that this refers to the king of one of these four empires. Called, his name was Antiochus IV, and he, he reigned from around 175 BC to 164 BC. He was a tyrant. He was a tyrant and a dictator. He persecuted God's people. His kingdom covered the, the, the region of Palestine. And he persecuted God's people. He ordered that Yahweh was not to be worshipped. And the sacrifices at the temple were to cease. Anyone who even seemed to be disobeying these commands was simply killed. They were simply killed. Now it's estimated that Antiochus killed thousands, thousands of Jews in just a few years. The promised land referred to in verse 9 simply refers to Palestine. Palestine or Israel as we know it today. The army of heaven that was referred to simply refers to God's people. God's people. The prince of the heavenly army probably refers simply to God. The temple under Antiochus became a place of pagan worship. Now the prophecy predicts that this persecution of God's people would last for um, 2,300 evenings and mornings. That's the strict uh, interpretation of the text. Now, the Good News Bible interprets this uh, as 1,150 days, which would be approximately three years uh, and two months, which would fit between the time uh, that an altar to Zeus was erected in the temple in 167 BC and the time it was rededicated to Judas Maccabeus in 164. That would be three years and two months. Or this phrase could also mean 2,300 days which would be approximately six years and four months, which would correspond from a date in 170 BC when the high priest was murdered, through to the death of Antiochus himself in 164 BC. Scholars differ on which is the correct interpretation here, but we could we can see it could work both ways. In this passage, we see kings building their kingdoms. Kings building their kingdoms. The Babylonian Empire had grown, and it was probably at its strongest under King Nebuchadnezzar. He had conquered Judah, as well as other nations, extending his kingdom. Under Belshazzar, at the time of this vision, it was probably in decline. And the Middle Persian Empire, represented by the Ram in this vision, was growing. King Cyrus was extending his kingdom by conquest. The Middle Persian Empire was actually an alliance between the Medes and the Persians. But this empire also ruled that in another couple of hundred years, it would be conquered by the Greek Empire. And Alexander the Great sought to build his empire, and he was very, very successful at this. He built a huge empire, as I mentioned earlier. But we see in all of these successive kings, the desire to build their own empires 
The desire to build their own empires, they chose to use the power that they had to extend their own kingdoms. They had power, but they wanted more power. And this is a human trait that we, we can see amongst many people. The desire for power and the desire for influence. Now I'm guessing that within the workplace, some of you have seen the employee who's simply keen for promotion so they can tell other people what to do. They want to be in charge. Even in school, I'm guessing young people have come across the people who like to feel they can tell others what to do or even what to think. That's really what bullying is all about. Power, or the desire for power. You know, I think most of us, perhaps even all of us, if we examine ourselves, we could possibly say that the idea of being in a position of power is actually quite attractive. Being able to tell people what to do. In our fallenness, the whole idea of having our own little empire, it can be quite appealing. When I was working uh, as a quantity surveyor, before I went into ministry, um, I went at one point to work for one of the big building contractors in Belfast. Uh, it was a job now that had a significant responsibility, uh, dealing with contracts uh, up to the value of five million pounds. One of the things that I was responsible for was negotiating with uh, and appointing subcontractors for large elements of each contract and, and then managing, managing them. Not long after I started the job, I, I met with a, a good friend and I was explaining to him, telling him how much I enjoyed the job and what I enjoyed about it. Uh, I enjoyed the fact that I was responsible for these major elements of work uh, and I had the power to hand out work of, of significant value uh, to, to contractors, to smaller contractors. And he made an interesting observation. Now he said to me, Richard, so it's the power you enjoy in this new job. And when I thought about it, he was right. He was right. I hadn't seen it before, but he was right. Any sort of power can go to our heads. We want more of it. It's part of our sinful condition, wanting to build our own little empire. But God calls us to recognize this within ourselves. He calls us to repent of this, to turn away from it. We're called to be servants, to put others before ourselves. Indeed, Christian growth could be seen in terms of our focus gradually and steadily been turned away from ourselves and becoming increasingly centered on, on, on God. As we journey on in faith, we begin to see the futility of wanting to build our own little empires, our own little kingdoms. And we can see the importance of being part of God's kingdom, into which we are called by grace. There's no conquest involved in this kingdom. It's given to us, given to his people, to those who believe. Now, in God's kingdom, of course, God comes first. And we are called to be a part of building this kingdom, this everlasting kingdom. As we follow history on from the empires that are prophesied in the book of Daniel, we see the one king arriving on the stage of history whose kingdom would be everlasting, whose reign would be eternal. The one who came as a servant, the one who gave everything to save his people. This is the king, the one like a son of man, the one that we are called to serve. And it's his kingdom that we're called to build. In this chapter, we also see the suffering, the suffering of God's people. Now these prophecies made in the, in the mid fifth century BC came to pass around 300 years later. And it was awful. It was awful. 
Imagine being ordered not to worship God. Otherwise you would be killed. Now in this age, in the Western world, we are very blessed indeed. We have religious freedom. But down through the ages, Christians have suffered terribly under rulers that have sought to wipe out, to wipe out their faith. Through the first 300 years of the early church, dependent on the Caesar in power, there were some horrendous times of persecution. Or you had a choice. The choice was simple. Either reject your faith on one hand, or be jailed, or probably even killed. Now from, from now until then, in, in various parts of the world, God's people have faced awful things. Awful things. In North Korea, currently, and we touched on this in the children's talk uh, a few weeks ago, if the government find out you're a Christian, you'll simply be taken away to a labor camp, never to be seen again. In many other countries of the world, your life and your livelihood are at risk if you're a Christian. The suffering of God's people is very real. Even in the West, in, in our society, in the workplace, in schools, with increasing secularization, there is a growing hostility to Christians and to the Christian faith. It is likely that it will become tougher and more challenging to be a follower of Christ as time moves forward. Things are likely to get harder. Now in John's Gospel, we are told, if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Words of Jesus. It all seems like a very pessimistic picture. But there's something else that we learn about the suffering of God's people in this chapter. The suffering of God's people is time limited. It's time limited. The prophecy predicts a time period of 2,300 evenings and mornings. And the events of the mid-2nd century BC in Palestine were limited to this time frame. Now God, as we know, has purpose in, in suffering. And it's of a, a limited duration. We could say that God knows the end. God knows the end. God has power over the forces of evil. And in his time, he will bring them to an end. And he will bring to an end the suffering of God's people. While we can't always understand why exactly God allows his people to suffer, we do trust that he has purpose in it. First Peter, we read, Therefore let all those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. So God desires that in times of suffering we trust him. More than that, we entrust ourselves to him. We trust also that God builds us up in character as we face the challenges that he puts before us. The suffering of God's people is time limited. Of course, ultimately, in the end, we know that God will put a complete end to suffering for his people. We read, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. When God's kingdom comes in its fullness, and we go to be with him, then we know that suffering will be a thing of the past. If you're going through a time of particular challenge at the moment, a time when you are really struggling, this time will not last forever. It is time limited. Often we know from our own experience, yes, of course, we go through difficult times, but God brings us through them. And we usually get to a point where we can look back and we, we can see that we have come out the other side of the difficult times, that God has also walked through us and given us all that we need to get through the awfulness of it. With hindsight, we can often see this. And yes, 
there are cases where for some Christians, life in its totality is a struggle, simply tough. It seems to be ongoing throughout life. But even for them, we know that the suffering is time limited. They will one day know that supreme pleasure of being in that place that Revelation described to us. That place of there being no more mourning or crying or pain. On that day when the kingdom comes, suffering will be at an end. Suffering is most certainly time limited. For the believer, this is, this is definitely true. It may in some rare cases last a lifetime, but it will certainly come to an end. The suffering of God's people is time limited. Now finally, the prophecies contained within this chapter, and indeed the prophecies throughout the book of Daniel as a, as a whole, are so detailed, they're so accurate, that some believe that these prophecies must have been written after the events happened. That would, have, that would be in the mid-2nd century BC. And I guess we can understand why they might think that. But there's one major problem with that point of view. Now, if this book was only written in the mid-2nd century, then these are not actually prophecies at all. In fact, the book would be a fabrication and a lie. But if we believe in a God who knows all things, a God who holds the future in his hands, then it's not impossible, perhaps not even difficult for us to grasp. God is able to communicate the future in whatever detail he chooses to. I suppose the argument could almost be boiled down to do we believe God's word is true? Now for most of us, the answer is yes, we do. Definitely. Of course it's true. We hold to this. Indeed, we celebrate this. The fact that we have God's truth. When we look at the predictions in this chapter, we can see with confidence that these things have come to pass. We therefore can have confidence in the prophecies regarding our own future. The prophecies in Daniel that have already been fulfilled give confidence in the prophecies in God's word regarding his kingdom. Now in the previous chapter, chapter 7, we read of the kingdom that is an eternal kingdom which will be given to God's people. In the Bible we can see a multitude, a multitude of prophecies that have already been fulfilled. So we can be assured that those prophecies regarding the end times will also be fulfilled. So as Christians, that gives us confidence. But I guess this fact could also be a warning, a warning for you. Jesus told people to repent because the kingdom of heaven was near. In scripture, we see a call, don't we? A call to turn away from sin call to turn to God and to believe in the one he sent, Jesus. The kingdom we are told that is coming, it is for the saints, meaning God's people. So for you this may be a warning. Are you one of God's people? If not, turn to him. Turn to him. You know, I like to keep up to date with the news, what's happening in the news. I would read news online. And there are a multitude of websites that you can go to where you can read the news. But some of them are simply unreliable. They're more interested, interested in scandal. They're not really interested in facts at all. But there are other news sites who have a good reputation for presenting the facts presenting real news, not just the gossipy news that you, you read in, in some places. And if you're careful, you shouldn't recognize those websites that do report with integrity. What they write proves to be true. It happened. You can trust them. 
And the Bible is that book that you can trust. And one reason for this is, as we've been discussing, the prophecies that have already come to pass in the Bible. Therefore, we can and should believe the prophecies that speak of the future. So we thought about the kings building their empires and how it can be appealing for us to build our own little empires. But there's only one empire or kingdom that there's any merit in building. There's only one king worth serving. So be builders of God's kingdom. That's the challenge. We thought about how the suffering of God's people is very real. But we also learned that it is time limited. We can usually get to a point where we can look back and see that God has brought us through our difficult time. Ultimately, we know that all suffering will come to an end when the kingdom comes. In our times of suffering, we should hold tightly on on to this truth. We reflected on, on the accuracy of the prophecies contained in Daniel and how this gives us confidence in the prophecies relating to the future. To God's kingdom, which chapter 7 tells us will be given to God's people. We can be confident that as believers we will one day be with God in his kingdom. Let's take a moment just to pause, think about, reflect on, on what we've heard. Loving Father, we thank you that your word promises us your kingdom. That your people will one day be with you forever in that place of complete contentment. Father, thank you that we can have confidence in this. Help us, Lord, not to build our own little kingdoms. But help us, Lord, to build your kingdom. Help us also, Lord, just to know that in those times of of challenge, of of suffering, that we will one day dwell with you, Lord, forever. Thank you for the encouragement that you give us in your word, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We close our service as we sing together, standing on the promises of God.
goodness of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and evermore. Amen.